Hello, I'm David R. Lewis. I'm glad you could join me for Theater of the Mind. In this heartland memory from my childhood, we're going back in time to the good old days. I went to the grocery store yesterday. That's not big news. I'm no stranger to grocery stores, but on this occasion, I was transported back in time to Dave Brumfield's general store in my hometown in the mid-1950s. Ah, yes, the good old days. Now, before we get all wound up about the social issues of the time, the myth of the good old days, and the rest of the claptrap some naysayers rely on to feel superior and salve their consciences, let me say that in some instances, they are exactly right. But to an eight-year-old in my humble village of less than 1,000 people, however, social issues meant who your best friend was, and we lived in a different world. There was no daycare. There were parents. If a kid didn't have two of them, somebody had died. There was no preschool or kindergarten. We spent our first six years at home, being kids. Then we became students. Soccer was something you did to a girl if she wouldn't leave you alone. And nothing was as pretty as a brand new baseball. Many of us had jobs before we were 10. We swam in the lake or the river. Summer evenings were spent on the porch or at the Friday night free movie in the park. The Salk vaccine for infantile paralysis was a godsend because parents weren't afraid of August anymore. And vacation Bible school was boring. Some things never change. But back to Dave Brumfield's general store. Dave Brumfield was my grandfather's sister's husband. The store was on the same lot as their house at the intersection of their street and Highway 150. I don't know what the name of the street was. The streets didn't have names. We knew where everybody lived. The store was small, even to me. Dave stocked things like sugar and salt cured hams that hung on strings from nails, lard in buckets, bacon wrapped in burlap, flour in cloth bags, maple syrup in tins that looked like cabins, beef and chicken in tubs of ice, Coca-Cola and 7-Up in a water-filled cooler, sugar in paper bags, eggs you had to bring your own basket for, Milk in bottles with six inches of cream on top, Barlow pocket knives, diamond matches, whorehound candy, a name that cracked us up when we got a little older, kerosene at 15 cents a gallon, and once in a while, a channel catfish or two on ice. Salmon came in cans, a shrimp was somebody little, and nobody would have known what orange roughy was. Dave Brumfield had been wounded in World War I and was never in good health, so when word circulated that a new store was coming to town, he was grateful to retire. The rest of us didn't realize his retirement signaled the end of an era, but it did. You see, the new store was something called an IGA food liner. None of us knew what that was, but it sounded awesome. Food liner. It had to be something pretty special. They built it close to the Baptist church, tore down five or six old houses just to make room for the thing. They put in a parking lot. There wasn't a store in town with a parking lot. And this one even had big tall lights in it. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Then, one fateful day, it opened. That evening, even though it was in easy walking distance of my home, my grandparents and I took the old 49 Plymouth. Didn't want to waste that parking lot. We approached it in awe. The place was a fraction of the size of a major hen house market, but to us, the mothership had landed. The outside was all lit up. The parking lot was like daytime. The doors opened by themselves. Inside, the endless brightly lit aisles displayed more goodies than any of us had ever seen in one spot. Good grief! You put the stuff on the table to pay for it, and it moved away from you toward the lady at the cash register all by itself. My little town had been invaded by selection and convenience. The next week, the IGA food liner had a grand opening on Friday night. The usual free movie in the city park was canceled. It couldn't compete with that. A band played in the parking lot. And I recall my grandfather saying that the whole damn town was there as he registered for the big drawing. Grand prize was 300 silver dollars. 
Near the end of the evening, the drawing was held. Minnie Parnell won a $20 gift certificate. Our next door neighbor, neighbors were awarded a brand new pressure cooker. Some other folks won some stuff. And then came the biggie. The MC reached into the big glass case and announced the winner. Frank White, my granddad. The 300 silver dollars were in a mesh potato sack. And when the guy passed it down to my grandpa, the sack broke, scattering the tinkling coins throughout the crowded parking lot. For the next few minutes, a steady stream of people brought my grandfather money. When we got home, he counted it. 299 silver dollars. The next day, somebody stopped him on the street and gave him the last one. And that is 300 of the reasons they call it the good old days. At least that's how it seems to me. I'm David R. Lewis. Thanks for dropping by Theater of the Mind.